Good afternoon, everyone. I am Krista Sineski, the Vice President of Marketing with Eloquest Healthcare, and we are so pleased to have you here with us today for one of our Wednesday workshop series. Uh, this format is designed to give you quick, actionable tips and resources from clinical experts, all with a goal of improving outcomes in your facilities. Today, we have an exceptional but brief presentation for you delivered by uh, nurse manager of the IV therapy and vascular access specialist, Lee Steer. Today is the first in a three-part series, which is entitled Growing a Vascular Access Specialty Team One Step at a Time. Uh, Lee will be sharing today how to demonstrate a vast financial value to your organization. He'll review key areas to improve efficiency, reduce waste, and improve patient and staff satisfaction. Uh, before I turn it over to Lee to walk us through this presentation, there are just a couple small housekeeping notes. Uh, first, as you probably noticed, you are, um, you do have your audio automatically muted, so we don't have any uh, background noise. That said, there are a couple opportunities for you to uh, interact with us. Um, if you have any questions for Lee, you can go ahead and type them into the questions box in your control panel. You can ask those questions at any time throughout the presentation, but we will hold them at, till the end, and Lee will address as many questions as we can at, as we have time for. Um, there also will be two poll questions that Lee has prepared into his presentation. So please interact with these poll questions when they appear on your screen, and we'll all get to see the results of everybody who's here with us today. Um, and finally, uh, in the handout section of your control panel, there is a handy cost calculator uh, that you can download. You can follow this cost, cal cost methodology that uh, Lee will be walking us through today in his presentation. Uh, with that out of the way, um, I, I do know that some of you are probably well acquainted with our presenter, but I do wanna take just a quick minute to give him his proper introduction. Uh, Lee Steer has been leading the IV team at Hartford Hospital for nearly 20 years. At his facility, all PIVs are inserted um, on inpatient units by the VAST team using a bundled approach. Lee has spoken at multiple local and national infusion and vascular access conferences on CLABSI prevention, CFAD occlusion management, and PIV insertions using a vascular access um, nurse and bundled approach. Lee is a member of the hospital's HAI committee and is a chair of the Hartford Healthcare Patient Care Clinical Value Team. He is the author of multiple peer-reviewed publications and the principal investigator of an ongoing randomized controlled trial. So with that, please join me in welcoming our Wednesday workshop presenter, uh, Mr. Lee Steer. Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, depending on which time zone you are watching from. Uh, thank you for all joining me and Krista. Thank you for the great introduction. So yes, uh, as Krista had mentioned, I'm gonna talk about growing a vascular access specialty team one step at a time. Here are uh, the first objectives of this um, um, first um, presentation. It's the financial justification. So we're gonna, I'm gonna show how to demonstrate value to your organization. We're gonna talk a little bit about productivity index, making sure that we're improving our efficiencies and capturing all those items that take us time that will help keep our productivity index to where it needs to be so that we can continue uh, filling open and vacant positions. We're gonna talk a little bit about waste and how we eliminate that and how that shows uh, value to your organization's um, goals. And we're gonna talk about how the steps we have taken, how that has how it's helped improve our patient and staff satisfaction. Hartford Hospital, not sure if any of you have been here, many of you may have, or maybe you've been in the state of Connecticut and through the area. Um, Hartford Hospital was built in 1854. It's a level one trauma center where it just seemed to be growing. I know we're only 867 licensed bed, but I don't it just seems like we keep adding more beds, but that number stays the same. Uh, we do have an air ambul ambulance service, LifeStar, lots of ED visits, many transitions. But mostly what I like to point out is we are a lean facility, and I have used lean um, a, a, with my team to make sure that we um, adopt some of the metho methodology out there to help us um, eliminate waste, um, non-value added actions and um, inefficiencies and variabilities. And you'll kind of get that throughout the whole presentation and, and some of the presentations moving forward. I also like to point out our core values, excellence, caring, safety, integrity, and we recently just added equity as one. Uh, these 
I find to be essential. These are what our administration has decided to focus on in terms of the care that we provide. So everything that I do, I really try to make sure that I focus on incorporating our core values into the conversations I have with my team, into the conversations I have with administrators. And uh, that just goes to show them that we are in supporting, supporting of, of everything that they are trying to achieve. So how do we demonstrate value in a lean orga organization? It's all about the data. You got to have data. Um, as my favorite Edward Deming says, in God we trust, all others must bring data. And without data, you're just another person with opinion. I always tell the story of uh, I've been working with my CNO. She's actually stepped up a little bit in her role as the system continues to grow. But she um, would always, I would always go to her and constantly tell her, you know, we have problems, IVs are a mess, you know, we, we, we can do better, I know we can. And she would always just look at me and say, go get the data. So I decided that's what I was gonna do. Um, and there's many ways to collect data, but again, if you're a lean facility, I highly encourage you to focus on reducing waste, variability, cost, and adverse outcomes, and take everything that you do and link it to the C-suite balanced scorecard initiatives. And for any of those who don't know what a balanced scorecard, it's like a dashboard and it's what the administration looks at in terms of um, how we're, they're doing on their key uh, performance um, metrics. So you always wanna, and, and it's not much different everywhere. I think that most are looking at how do you decrease your length of stay? That is a huge um, money maker for the hospital if they can get their length of stay down get p new people admitted into the hospital get people out you know as quickly as possible making sure you focus on quality less infections adverse events um, look at you know ways to save money and patient and nurse fat satisfaction and, and where is there anywhere better to look at waste and that's an iv therapy every patient that gets admitted to the hospital or they say in the literature 90 percent of all patients that get admitted do end up with some sort of vascular access device during their stay, um, but the waste is astronomical. I mean, I how many times you know have I been in an area where I've seen you know multiple nurses have attempted IVs and there's wrappers all over the place. Sometimes there's you know IVs on the floor, tubing all around, bags you know empty, full, just lying around. So there's a lot of opportunity to try to drive down waste and be more lean in the care that we provide, especially in IV therapy. Poll question, does your hospital currently have a VAST? The results are in, the majority do have uh, a VAST, 74% um, and 26% do not currently have a VAST. And I bet that 26% wants a VAST. <laughs> um, very interesting, I, you know, just before doing this, um, com this um, webinar, I got an email from a local hospital in Connecticut who's, uh, they're looking to cut the IV team for cost savings. So uh, they were reaching out to me, hoping I can help them, um, you know, with, with some of the stuff that we've done here to support building that business case back up. So let's talk about VAS. What is, you know, our Infusion Nurses Society, the standards in um, 2000, and I believe, the, what did these come out in 21? Uh, they, they put a lot of new information in there about VAS um, and, and, the, and the need for them. Um, they really talk about organizing a team of clinicians dedicated to the, you know, exclusively to infusion practices, because we just end up with better, um, better outcomes, especially in acute care facilities where most patients are getting some type of infusion. If uh, you know PIV is inserted in um, by in adults, um, greater first success, success um, rates and lower rates of complications when a vascular access team is taking care of the, all of that. And how important is it to track and um, analyze the services you provide, making sure that you show that you're a financial con contribution to the organization and that anything that you do will also offset some of the costs that they're trying to achieve or savings they're trying to achieve. And that uh, um, anytime you have a team, there are absolutely reduced um, healthcare acquired uh, uh, complications, especially around infections, um, pneumos, um, and um, other things related to central venous access devices. This is uh, the IV therapy budget for my team. Uh, so I, I like to show a little comparison. So in fiscal year 2020, we had a total billable service of 16 uh, million dollars. I think we took over the um, 
we, we expanded our team. It was, believe it was in like 2000, 2016, 2017. We really started to expand it more um, in, the, in this uh, subsequent years as we were taking on more responsibility. So in fiscal year 2022, you can see how quickly our budget went up. We were budgeted for 23 million, ended up with 25 million. So we had a nice little variance of 1.5 million. And then our billable services uh, year to date this year is going to be annualized um, at 26 million. Um, now, I always look at this and kind of laugh and chuckle because do I think that we're actually receiving 26 million from our payers out there? No, we are billing for that. We're probably not receiving that. But what I will say is it looks great on paper. Um, every year that seat, that number keeps going up and, it, and you know nobody argues it with me. So it's a nice uh, way to show that you are providing an absolute value to your hospital. Um, I know that especially with COVID being over, there are many hospitals that are really starting to realize how, how much money they spent and how in the deficit they are. And if you look at it, hospitals receive only $1 out of every $3 spent on healthcare in the United States. So, you know, you must show that you're an asset, not a liability, because if, you don't, if you're not showing that you're making money, um, saving, helping save lives, reducing adverse outcomes, reducing costs, there's a good chance that you could be the next department that gets cut. Productivity index. This is very important for our um, our movement forward, um, and what this has done for us. And this was developed, I believe, in 2015 when we had some consultants come in, and they created a productivity index for all um, all departments. We are a variable department, so ours is very affected by the number of um, procedures that we perform, whether they're billable or non-billable. And I want to talk a little bit about the non-billable because I think that's very important. We all got, every department gets a worked hours per unit of surface. And basically what a productivity index does is it looks at your paid FTEs versus targets. And it also looks at your worked FTEs and it also looks at the, the overtime that you're utilizing. So again, this becomes very important and I, I hammer this into my team all the time. It's so important that we make sure that we're charging appropriately and that we're completing certain orders that don't um, have a billable CPT code to them, but it was something that I was able to build into our department's productivity index because we do a lot of them and it requires a lot of time. So those are um, listed down below on the slide. We do Dobhoff tube insertions. We cannot bill for those. Uh, we pull out all central venous catheters outside of the ICU settings. We can't bill for those. We do uh, central venous catheter dressing changes and ultrasound guided IV insertions. Now, I know that ultrasound guided IV insertions, there is a, a billable CPT for those where you have to actually download an image of the vessel that you're targeting. Um, unfortunately, we have the, don't have that set up quite yet, but we're going to get there soon. So that's going to add another nice piece of income because we use our ultrasound on just about everybody. Very important to stay green. Red is not good. We are currently a little bit in the red after our last um, round of, because I get this every pay period. So it's every two weeks. We're a little bit in the red right now. But one thing I do to justify that, uh, last week we introduced a brand new product to the IV therapy department and we did a lot of training with that. So a lot of cost shifting hours. I needed a lot more staff around to make sure that um, we could, you know, stay focused on those who are getting um, oriented to the new product. But I also always stress when I'm looking at this to say, look at my overtime, it's less than 1%. So, you know, it's, there's always a, you know, a little bit of a counteract that you gotta kind of say one might lead to another. So it's a great tool for me. Um, I look at it very diligently. And if every new position that I wanna try to go get or any position that I need to be filled, I have to put these numbers into um, the, the, the report that got sent to a committee that reviews all open positions. So another poll question, does your team currently keep a database of the billable procedures you perform? Okay, we do have a good number of our uh, audience that's participated and it is almost split in half. 51% does have a database and 49% does not. 
So great for the 51%, for the 49%, I please reach out to me. <laughs> uh, let's let's get you up there because we do need to uh, make sure that uh, we're, we're showing um, all of us that we're doing the right thing. So one of the first ideas that my team and I had when we started our journey um, towards you know, in expanding our vascular access services, we really wanted to look at our um, central venous catheter occlusion management process. Um, at the time is, I wanted to change our needle as connectors. We were looking at the Nexus Medical TKO 6P, which is an anti-reflux needle as connector. And one of the things that I really wanted to do was make sure I held um, Nexus to their um, their 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 percentage of what they felt they could reduce our out to place usage at. We were using about 119 milligrams a month, which I found was not very high, but when I really started to look at it and started to do the study, I realized that it was a lot higher than it needed to be. So when we did study it, we, we were also heparinizing lines prior to this. Uh, and so when we decided to trial the anti-reflux needles connector, the TKO6P, we had put it on every ICU patient um, on, on the first of a month. We eliminated heparin. I made sure that every single line flushed and had a good blood return. And it was about four days before we ended up giving any TPA at all. Um, so right away, I knew that that was a good product and that it was going to help us. But as we did the study, I started to realize more changes needed to occur because what nursing was doing a lot of times was they were using it as a first line of defense versus a last line. So you can picture it, the nurse goes in, she's you know busy, she wants to draw a line out of a pick line, blood out of a pick line. She goes up to it, flushes easily, can't get any blood return, goes right to the doctor and says, please order TPA. Another dose of TPA after the first one fails, and then after the second dose, they would give the team, my team a call to come evaluate. So what I found is that you know even our process was a little bit different from each individual. So what we had decided to do was take over the ordering of all out the place, and um, in the process, we developed a, the acute non-tunneled um, CVC algorithm that you see up here. And it's a step-by-step -step process that my, my team follows. And the first, pro first part of it is making sure that the line is necessary. Because what was happening, a lot of times TPA was being given at nighttime, and then the next day the patient would be discharged and we'd be yanking the line out. So that's not, that's waste. And, and each milligram of TPA is uh, 75 milligrams. So it really does add up. So if you look on that algorithm, the very last step is ordering TPA. So we had a, a very nice you know, process with this and um, in some future webinars, uh, you will also get to see how we've been able to sustain uh, the savings that we've achieved with that. This is the savings, as you can see. So our baseline was 119 milligrams a month with the introduction of the anti-reflux needles connector and us taking over the ordering of Altiplase. We've been able to sustain a nice reduction through year 2015 and 2016, where we had a 61% uh, overall reduction from our two four, two, 2014 baseline. This was the study that we did. Uh, most of you probably remember it as the PIV Five Rights Bundle Study. Um, it was uh, published in 2019. And uh, this was a study that really launched our ability to take over IV therapy in our hospital. It involved um, a five rights approach where you have the right proficiency of a right inserter. The person is very competent as um, you know inserting peripheral IV catheters using vein to catheter uh, ratios, uh, right supplies. So we use the TKO 6P anti-reflux needles connector. We covered it up with a antimicrobial Prevahex uh, pure chlorhexidine bordered antimicrobial dressing, um, making sure that we're using ultrasound or visual vein visualizing technology, and then the right assessment after the line was inserted. And as you can see our results, we had a 29% reduction in IV complications. Uh, we Our dwell time, our highest catheter stayed in for 333 hours versus 110. Um, the first stick success rate, we could only capture the IV team's first stick success rate, which was 96%. The 33% is what is in the current literature. So very nice results. And the best part of that is I worked with my CFO and my CNO to put a cost analysis uh, to each group um, per bed per year. So the, the group number one um, 
which was the generalist model in certain EIVs, their cost was $4,781 per bed versus $1,405 if the VAS was to do all insertions. So a nice savings on $3,376. So when I presented this to my CNO, um, very, um, she didn't really even, you know, she saw the results, but what really um, tore her apart was the pictures that I sent her. So these, as you can see, are the pictures of what you would see nowadays if you were a patient at Hartford Hospital. Um, nice dressings. Um, they're a little bit different shaped at this point in time, but um, secured consistently the same way. There's just a lot. Of every What do you see here? This is evidence-based best practice. And when you look at the cost analysis of what we did, so we had an 89% success rate of our catheters lending, lasting from the beginning to the end of therapy. So how did we come up with this cost analysis? We looked at two very unemotional numbers. You can't argue them. The number of MITs to your hospital, as well as the number of catheters you purchased in a year. So we took the number of MITs, but we only took 75% of those patients because we wanted to think about the ones that if the IV team took over, who would we be putting that IV in? You know, those patients who go into the ORs or the GI suites and they get their IVs put in by that team, they would end up on the floor. So we accounted that to be about 25%. So 75% of the admissions was 33,000. Based off of an 89% success rate of catheters lasting from the beginning to the end of therapy, that brought us down from 148,000 catheters to 36,835 catheters. Most importantly, we took the time it takes to put an IV, and we um, the literature says about 20 minutes. Some says 25, I believe, um, and calculated if we were going to, if my team was going to put in 36,835 catheters times 20 minutes, that was going to be 12,000 hours of nursing time. As you can see, labor um, down below 1868. That's 20 minutes of an IV trained. Um, we found that figure on um, Glassdoor.com. Uh, we, the supplies, we were using better supplies, so a higher cost per IV of 33.8, giving us a total of $1.2 million spent per year in IV therapy. Um, and then we took our 867 beds and divided that into the $1.2 million to come up with the 14 14.05. This was post-study results, and I'm kind of doing this a little bit backwards for a reason, um, but you'll see uh, the results of what it would have been uh, calculated pre-study. So one of the most important things I want to say is, you know, obviously, a lot of times people will say to me, well, you're not eliminating nurses. You're absolutely right, but I'm giving time back to nursing so that they can focus a lot on some of the other key performance metrics that they must do. And that's, you know, helping patients with education, better bedside care, really working with a, um, a collaborative team to try to get that patient transition to their next level of care, wherever that may be, whether it be home or skilled nursing facility as soon as possible. But what we didn't look for in all the savings was all the other added benefits, such as reduced adverse events increased patient satisfaction that might lead to better reimbursement, are in training P on PIV insertions. I mean, it was just, we were, the rotation of nurses through this organization and every organization is increasing. So all that time spent is just lost money. Um, so that just helps out. This was the pre-study cost analysis. Um, so the same amount of emits, 33,486. This is 75% of the catheters that we had purchased of 148,200. You divide the MITs into the catheters and that gets you a catheter per patient visit of 4.4. 4. 148,200 catheters inserted by nursing results in 49,400 nursing hours. So, you know, compare that to the 12,000. That's a lot of time I'm giving back to the organization to help um, facilitate um, better care at the bedside. The labor was a little bit lower, so nurses do get paid a little bit better if they're an IV therapy nurse in the state of Connecticut. The supplies were a little less because we weren't using the best of supplies. So our cost per IV at that point in time was 28 compared to the 33 um, that it would cost if the IV team was placing them. So we get a total of 4.1 million. Divide the 867 beds into it gives you $4,781 per bed for IV therapy. So again, a lot of um, a lot of cost. I think it's uh, conservative and a lot of a lot of savings bringing in the vascular access team. And as you can see, those pictures, those were them, and those are the ones that I showed my CNO, and that's all she needed to see in order to 
grant me what I wanted. So, um, other another way to reduce waste, um, eliminating unplanned um, central venous uh, dressing changes using Mastisol. Um, some of you may know it as gum mastic, um, but it definitely improves dressing adherence. We uh, brought this in. We've trialed it in Bliss 10i, which is one of our cardiac ICU. This is where those patients are sitting up waiting for their open hearts. They have to have a swan gans catheter in place in order to stay at a certain level on the um, transplant list. Before the trial, we did uh, we looked at four different weeks where we went through and looked at every single line, and we had an average percent of non-intact dressings at 77%. After the trial, we uh, had a little washout period. Um, so then we brought in Massasol. We did another four weeks of um, application, education, and then monitoring. And then that brought us from 77% down to a 36% average non-intact rate. But most significantly important, I think, is the fact that we had 0% that were completely detached, 0% that were partially detached. So it was all edges lifting. And really, that just comes around to a little bit more education, making sure hair is getting trimmed if necessary. Um, so lots of cost savings, again, in nursing time, supplies, and hopefully CLABC um, reductions. Uh, this was an actual quote. I walked in one day to the ICU. We were going to uh, monitor. Um, at, you know, this is during the mass assault application, and somebody stopped me right as I entered the door and, and just looked at me and said, we just absolutely love this product. We used to change our IJ dressings every single day. So the product works and um, helps uh, save the hospital money. So we, now that we've taken over, uh, we did do, we, we, we used to do some patient satisfaction. We used to have courtesy of the person who started the IV. Unfortunately, that was taken off of our press Ganey survey. So I have nothing to compare to this date. But as you can see, during our takeover, we had a nice uh, um, inclined trend of positive outcomes or positive patient responses. What I do like to show is that during March um, 20 to June of 20, 2020, um, we had COVID come. So what we had to do is revert back to our old ways of doing IV therapy, and that was being reactive versus proactive. Right now we round, whereas at that point in time, we could not round on patients because we needed to preserve PPE, we needed to protect our staff, protect patients. So we would wait till the nurses called. You could see the uh, dip in our uh, patient satisfaction. COVID let up a little bit, and we were able to get back to re proactive rounding. And as you can see, we had the subsequent increase in uh, patient satisfaction again. Uh, nurses satisfaction with the vast expansion. Um, this was done a few months after we took over. I needed to wash out some of the, um, the negativity that was out there in terms of my team taking over all the IV insertions, because as we know, there are many nurses who love to put in IVs. They may not love vascular access, but they love to put the IV catheters in. So uh, there was definitely a little bit of tension when we first took over. So what we did is we surveyed three units, 121 nurses responded. We had a medical unit, cardiology unit, a medical step down. And the main question was, do you believe that having the IV team in place has saved you time? And 86% said yes. I mean, that's huge. Um, and then we asked, please explain where you've chosen to invest that extra time and just where I wanted it to be invested was more patients interaction. And then they, uh, we had a few questions on, you know, how does this impacted your daily role and responsibilities? And many, uh, at least 54% talked about fewer pump alarms, 61% uh, fewer IV restarts, 77% fewer unplanned dressing changes, 78% fewer IV complications, and 81% fewer patient complaints. Those are very positive results. Um, and this is the stuff that no matter what, I always make sure to, um, put on the forefront of my uh, C8, my upper administration, so they can see how we are providing value to this organization. So this is the uh, free resource, the cost calculator. Um, it's very simple to use. Anyone can use it. You just got to get your admissions um, per um, per year, um, and usually you can go on any on on Google and just type that in for your facility get the number of catheters um, and that will give you your catheters per patient visit. It'll calculate the hours and all that stuff. So a really good resource for all of you. Um, and if you need help, um, please reach out to me and I can help walk you through it. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Lee. So much great information in this presentation. I really appreciate it. Um, we did have a few questions that came in, and I know we are, you know, trying to keep this brief and right toward a, the end of our timeline. So we'll just ask a couple of them for those of you that, who can still hang on with us. Um, the first one that we have coming in is when you talked about your um, your your PIV5 rights bundle. Can you clarify what products are in that bundle? Yeah, so the products that we used in the bundle during the study were um, so a 1.75 inch catheter, mostly 22 gauge. We used the anti reflux needles connector, um, which was bonded to a microbore extension set. Um, we used a um, antimicrobial um, chlorhexidine um, board, um, antimicrobial border dressing. Obviously, all the other stuff that you normally would use your CHG for, you know, cleansing as long as the patient didn't have a CH allergy. And just moving forward, one of the things um, that is, Krista, you had mentioned in the very beginning that we're going to be running another study, um, or that I currently am, um, we're using Massasol on all our peripheral IVs because one of the two failure modes that we found in the first study mostly were. Um, dressing adherence um, and the other one was the phlebitis rate was a, was close um, was still low but it, it was one of the trying to look at how could we prevent more phlebitis from happening as well as how can we prevent more um, IV failures from dressings uh, falling off early so that will be in study number two. Awesome um, and so I guess on a related note someone's asked are you using the Massasol for I guess every dressing or every type of uh, device, and what yeah. do you use for your remover? Yeah, so we use Massasol. It's in our central line dressing change kits. I absolutely believe that if you want um, to get compliance, you have to have it in the kit. Otherwise, people are going to forget, and they're just not going to apply it. Um, we do not have the remover, the detach-all, in our central line dressing change kits. We just have that um, on hand for people to use. What I have found is that if you're doing an, uh, an unplanned dressing change, let's say that my team did the dressing change yesterday and the patient's, you know, suddenly gets discharged the following day, that's when you really need that adhesive removal. But on day seven, I find that the dressings come off um, pretty, pretty easily. And again, we just make sure we also have that around though so that we don't prevent, um, cause any uh, Mars, any you know tissue breakdown from dressing changes and stuff, so. And then hopefully, right now my staff are, well, I shouldn't say hopefully, right now my staff are using um, Massasol at, as needed on their peripheral IV. So if they think that somebody's gonna sweat them off early and such, they'll use it. I think some are pretty, pretty diligent about using it just upon everybody. But my whole goal is to, you know, do the study, again, show the financial savings and the, you know, positive re results and to eventually have that Massasol product into our PIV, Five Rights IV Start Kit. Awesome. Uh, again, asking about your data collection process. So mm -hmm. was this process manual or were you able to pull information from the electronic record and what system do you use? Yeah, so we're using Epic. Um, there are some ways I can pull um, data from that. I do, uh, it's not very easy, I admit. You know, it's always good when you do a study that the IRB has approved because you have to be very methodical and very meticulous about the data you collect. Um, so it's it was it was great to see the results of the study. Hard to follow those results as we go down the road. Um, we did do another study recently on a forced activated separation device called Safe Break, and um, during that study of 300 patients, we actually ha uh, showed that the control group was the, which was the IVs that my team inserted um, without the forced activated separation device. We had a 26 percent. Um, uh, IV failure rate before the end of the therapy. So much better than the national average of 46%. Some of the data that we collect is hand. Um, I do have ways I can go in Epic. I have a report built where I can look at our TPA usage on a daily basis. I don't look at it every day, but there's also um, a, 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 a application in um, in Epic, and I forget exactly what it's called. I think it's cognitive something dicer um, but it's a way that i can actually 
go in and extrapolate my TPA data um, usage. So that's very helpful. But um, I do know that, you know, getting real time data is a little bit challenging. So a lot of it's retrospective, especially with my productivity index. I really don't know um, how that's going to be impacted until payroll is done. So I am working um, with another company right now. We're hoping to, um, you know, be able to um, present an app. It's very close that will help uh, me be able to um, capture real-time data like at the, at the press of a button. So we're looking forward to that and hopefully um, we'll come soon because we all need data. You know, and it is hard to get from Epic. I realize that. I don't think it's any easier in Cerner. So, you know, stay tuned. More to come. There will be a better way um, down the road. So. Awesome. Thank you so much. We are getting close on the time and we have had just a ton of questions that have come in um, and I don't think we'll have opportunity to address all of them today. But as Lee mentioned, we are going to have him back for the next two Wednesdays. So you can come back and get your questions submitted then and we'll also um, forward some of these questions to him offline and see if we can get a response for you. Definitely. Um, but I will ask, I guess, just one more question before we wrap things up. And this is related to when you were sharing um, your needleless connector consumption, or I guess your needleless connector um, trial and implementation. Um, did your consumption change when you switched to the new anti-reflux co connector? Yeah, so very surprisingly, it was not anything I expected. Um, so it was, it was actually, a great surprise because it really then was able to um obviously the anti-reflux needles connector is going to cost a little bit more it has more parts um that's just how it is in manufacturing um, we were at first using a first line uh generation of needles connectors and it was uh you know fully blue so you couldn't see whether you were flushing blood out of it completely um so by bringing in the anti-reflux needles connector um i, I this, this is what i believe occurred but we ended up with a uh, we were pleasantly surprised to achieve a 41 percent reduction um which um represented an annual decrease of over 40,000 needles connectors which was great and i think it really has a lot to do with the design and the features of it um uh, probably the fact that staff are really not having to troubleshoot as many central venous catheters as they were prior but also because they can see whether the blood is clear it's um, out of it or not because it's a clear design so um, yeah very pleasantly um, nice nice surprise so not expected at all wonderful thank you so much for that um, and with that I guess we will uh, conclude so thank you so much Lee and thank you yeah. everyone for joining us here today